Uh, hi all, um, thanks for everyone for joining. It's two o'clock now, so um, I think we'll kick things off, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so first, I just wanna say hi and uh, welcome to Young Planners Cymru's follow-up One Planet Development webinar. Uh, we had 60 people book onto the event today and we've got uh, about 30 people with us at the moment. So hopefully we'll get a few more people uh, to join as we go on. And um, we'd just like to thank, uh, thank you all very much for joining us today and um, we hope you're all keeping well and staying safe during this time. Uh, YPC would also like to thank our speakers, David Thorpe, uh, co-founder of the One Planet Council and One Planet Centre Community Interest Company, and James Shorten, the author of the One Planet Development Practice Guidance for Welsh Government, uh, for taking part today um, and taking some time out of their busy schedules to speak to us. So we're very grateful for that. Thanks very much, guys. And um, uh, also following on from the success of our One Planet Development webinar, which took place on the 19th of May, our speakers will be addressing some of the open-ended questions raised within our previous webinar. It will also be an opportunity for you guys um, in attendance to raise any burning questions you might have um, with two experts in all things One Planet Development. Um, so, and as well, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the uh, chat feature, which you should see on the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToMeeting control panel. And um, it'd be great if you could just um, clearly state which speaker that you'd like to answer your question, and then we'll kindly ask our speakers to answer those questions once the presentation's been complete. Um, and also, just to make sure during the presentation, it'd be great if you guys um, in attendance could just keep your camera switched off and your microphones on mute. That would be really helpful. And um, I'll now pass you over to James, who's going to kick the presentation off. So when you're ready, James. OK, thank you, Abby. Um, just wanted to, well, the One Planet Development, I'll, I'll slightly flip what's uh, the order in which my points come up. The One Planet Development Policy in Wales uh, began in in the late 90s, really, with some fairly contentious um, planning situations, such as that at Bristol Moor and Tony Wrench's Roundhouse. And I did a piece of work for the Countryside Council for Wales in 2002, when I was an academic, where we investigated uh, a whole range of uh, what was called at that time low impact developments in Wales uh, quite methodically by comparing them to the Welsh Government's current sustainable development framework and then we also compared other things uh, particularly farm diversification on a, on a typical Welsh farm to the same framework and we discovered that um, the low impact developments were fulfilling a considerably larger amount of the sustainable development objectives of the Welsh Government than the things that were getting planning permission, even though the low impact developments were very contentious in planning terms. So we had this research finding, which I could summarize by saying that the planning system was being unduly hard on something which in other respects it was seeking to promote because it was highly sustainable development. So come all the way through to TAN 6, sorry, sorry TAN, it is TAN 6, isn't it? Anyhow, and the introduction of the One Planet policy under Jane, Jane Davidson's uh, administration. And then we had national policy for OPD, but it was brought into this One Planet framework instead of being low impact as it was before. And, and we've had it since 2012 now. So there's quite a history to this. Um, having done the research for CCW in 2002, um, now working independently, uh, myself and, and another and a group of people, um, including Bill Knight, who did all the footprint work, uh, then wrote the practice guide for the Welsh Government. And if you've looked at it, you'll notice that it's, it's quite a substantial document. It's 80 pages. It's very detailed. And, and we now have under that around 50 One Planet Development households living across the countryside in Wales. I think what I'd like to explain is that this is a a very unusual form of planning consent, whereas we tend to focus as planners on the dwelling. In fact, it's the consent for an entire land use system, including the agriculture and forestry elements. And the basic premise on which it's given is that if you can support yourself substantially from the land through the uh, detail of the management plan, which is a compulsory part of the planning application, then you can have a, a consent to live there because you can support yourself from that piece of land in a place where 
usually you wouldn't be allowed to live. But focus on the dwelling is somewhat misleading because the, the guidance and, and OPD management plans also contain an exit strategy whereby if the management plan fails and has not been uh, corrected by remedial action, then uh, the house has to go. And this was a way of providing the guarantee because the planning system, as I'm sure you're all aware, has uh, difficulties with the desirability of a house in the countryside being an exception to policy. And so OPD being justified by the capacity of the site to support its residents needed a guarantee whereby if uh, those activities stopped, the residents also stopped. And we had detailed input from the planning inspectorate and, and Welsh Assembly planning lawyers to make sure that that was achievable. So there are two interesting things going on there. The first is it's essentially a planning consent for an entire land use system because that's what the policy seeks, described and governed by a management plan. But secondly, it, it's reversible and that's very unusual. And that also brings me to discuss the fact that there's a detailed monitoring regime by which all that is checked as it goes along. So as a planner, it's different. It's not just something where you give consent cross your fingers that it works and walk away. You have an ongoing relationship with the development and if it doesn't work, you're able to intervene. But if it does work, of course, you're able to learn from that as well. So um, I'm the main author of the guidance, but there was a team of it which wrote it. Um, through my consultancy, Terra Permagia, we're now involved in uh, one pallet development applications every year, a few, but we're also involved in trying to bring the policy to England and indeed, Dartmoor National Park has a, a policy which is very similar to the OPD policy in its submission draft local plan. And I spoke to the planning officers last week and they intend to carry that forward. Cornwall Council also has consulted on what does climate emergency mean that OPD might also be relevant to Cornwall and they are considering integrating it into their next version of the local plan. So, OPD, as well as uh, becoming established in Wales, is now catching the eye of some English uh, planning authorities. One other thing I'd like to just explain briefly is OPD is not a, a policy which defines a thing. It's not saying OPD looks like this. It's very deliberately a set of criteria, which are called in the guidance essential criteria, which then allow a particular site or a particular set of skills or entrepreneurial abilities to then form an APD that must meet the essential criteria within the guidance, but could be a number of things. It's not defining a design. It's, it's saying that for, uh, to fulfill the APD policy, certain outcomes are required, such as meeting 65% of your own food needs from the site, all of your own energy needs and so on. But those, those things can be done in different ways. And that's, again, it's an interesting field for planning to be setting criteria but then to step back from the outcome because it's more interested in, in uh, results than particular design issues. So a very radical policy in, in terms of the UK planning system as a whole. Uh, many interesting things to talk about, such as some of the questions about where might it be broadened to and so on. But I will, I will stop talking at this point, allow David to speak, and then I'll be very pleased to get into the discussion. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm David Thorpe. I was a co-founder and patron of the One Planet Council at a time um, when near the beginning of the implementation period of the policy, uh, I was asked by Jane Davidson, who brought it in, who was no longer Environment Minister, um, but had an interest in it, to write a book which became the One Planet Life, and it's the kind of manual that's used by a lot of people for living the One Planet Life and putting in their planning applications and so on. And during the research phase of this, a lot of planning applications were being turned down. And there was a summit, a meeting held at Lamas in Pembrokeshire, uh, which is a settlement of nine small holdings with houses that predates the policy and in a sense was key in the framing of it. And 
out of that meeting, it was decided to form the council because it would have several purposes. One would be to support planning applicants. One would be to lobby on behalf of the policy at Welsh Government and local authority level. And the other would be to run courses and training courses, both for planners and for applicants. Um, and um, it thus provides a bridge between applicants and the planning authorities. Um, and nowadays it has a very thriving Facebook page, which has over 5,000 members on it with many joining every day. And we've seen a particular surge in interest as a result of lockdown and the COVID emergency. <clears throat> um, last year, I formed the One Planet Centre Community Interest Company as a way of trying to actually turn this high level of interest into um, basically a source of income for myself and colleagues involved in all of this. Um, because the council itself is an entirely voluntary um, organisation that is run mostly now by people who are actually living on One Planet developments. Um, now, towards the end of the uh, one research in the One Planet Life, I became interested in how this uh, policy and the principles behind it that James has outlined so well could be scaled up. And I began scouring the world for examples that were similar in spirit. Um, and it, some of those are at the end of the One Planet Life in the case studies and then uh, last year I published One Planet Cities which is an attempt to try and bring all this together and imagine basically how the entire world, cities included, could uh, live and sustain their, their inhabitants well within planet planetary boundaries which is entirely the aim of the, of the One Planet Development Policy because it is all about the ecological footprint of the inhabitants. Um, so part of this is an ecological footprint calculator which was developed by the Welsh Government but by Bill Knight, one of James's colleagues, <coughs> which uh, basically anybody can fill it out now but it uh, has to be filled out by applicants and by residents in the first five years to prove that by the end of five years after having uh, gained planning permission they have an ecological footprint of around 1.88 global hectares per person, which effectively ties the carrying capacity of the land to the occupation of the land. And that 1.88 global hectares is actually larger than what it would be now if there was a fair distribution of biocapacity and resources to everybody on the planet. It would actually be about 1.7 global hectares, according to the latest research by WWF. <clears throat> so we can talk about how this kind of thing can scale up later, um, but uh, I've probably talked enough now and we should go on to your questions. Brilliant, thank you both for introducing yourselves there and um, as Abby discussed at the beginning, this is an opportunity for us to discuss some of the open-ended questions which were raised during the previous One Planet Development webinar. So to kick us all off, um, this first question is directed at James. So there are current restrictions within the planning system in relation to new housing in the open countryside. Why do you think one planet development should be considered an exception to this? And possibly could one planet development be seen as sort of like a planning loophole to allow applicants to be able to build residential properties in locations which would never otherwise be considered as a development site. We also kind of reflected on the fact that whether one plant development could be used to obtain permission for a farm dwelling. Yes, thanks. I'll deal with the last point first. I mean, the Welsh Government has policy for rural enterprise dwellings, which is entirely separate for one planet development, uh, and deliberately so, because they are quite different things. So. There would be no point in trying to seek consent for a farm dwelling through OPD. However, the notion that a farm family might, uh, for their children, for example, have some of their children do an OPD on the farm is completely reasonable and um, possible. Um, in terms of the loophole point, um, if, if it were a loophole, it'd be a very precarious one 
for the reasons of the exit strategy, which is that should you not fulfill your management plan, uh, basically how the exit strategy works is the dwelling is expected to be built in such a way of natural and low impact materials that it can be removed fairly easily. So if you didn't fulfill your management plan, you would have to leave. So really, you only would approach an OPD if you intended to do it for real, because there's annual monitoring, uh, and that annual monitoring is binding after the first five years of setup. Um, it's always an interesting discussion, this, amongst prospective applicants. I think some people do approach it uh, considering it could be a loophole. But if you think that you have to, within five years, lay out the site in such a way that you can both substantially feed yourself from it, but also meet your basic income needs from it, which for a household of two might be somewhere between five and eight thousand um, pounds. Otherwise, all of that work you've done is at jeopardy because you cannot fulfill the management plan, then it it's it's really not a loophole at all. In, in fact, it's a form of voluntary simplicity. It's a different form of livelihood and lifestyle, livelihood being how you earn your living, lifestyle being how you choose to live. And um, sorry, my colleague sneezing has just really distracted me. So <laughs> um, really, yeah, I mean, OPD, it would be foolhardy to regard it as a loophole. I don't think we have any experience. I mean, also OPD applications are scrutinized very hard. So to obtain a consent, as I would suggest, is also pretty difficult. It's, it's a serious undertaking. The reasons that we have it, though, as a, an exception to what you could regard as housing policies in the open countryside, because you do live there, despite everything I've said, is because it's a way of modeling a way of life, which we're all going to have to get to some way or another. You know, to hit net zero by 2050, we all have to also hit one planet. And if we don't, the the, the um, consequences are are drastic. So you could regard it as a pioneering policy. Uh, the principal point there is that if you don't live on your site, that synergy of how you work with the site, you know, drawing your energy from it, able to feed yourself, drawing a modest livelihood is, is virtually impossible. If you had to visit that site and drive to it every day, uh, none of it would work. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, David, do you have any thoughts on those points or should we move on to the next question? It's certainly not a loophole. Absolutely not. And uh, I think those people who suggest that it is have a political agenda, basically. Uh, anybody who tries to do this uh, and goes through the planning process is at the moment. Uh, and finds it as difficult as they do. And it should be made easier, by the way. And perhaps we can hopefully talk about how it might be. Um, then they'll find out that it's certainly not a loophole. Now, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this is also directed at James Fear. So, firstly, how are impacts arising from travel and connectivity assessed, even if these impacts impacts are reduced to an acceptable level in line with one planet development? Are they really promoting a sustainable pattern of development? Could initiatives be introduced to reduce the need to travel alongside OPD, such as prioritise walking and cycling instead of owning your own car? And could mobility be introduced as a service, such as better public transport systems and the use of car clubs? And this also links into the fact that, do you think people might think this is potentially too restrictive compared to our everyday lives in the 21st century? Yeah, I think I'll take the second point first again. Um, for some people, it's too restrictive. For other people, it's exactly what they wish to do. And if you think about um, trying to achieve a one planet footprint in, in an area of normal development, it's actually very hard. If you want to live in a, in a lower footprint fashion, usually it's more difficult and more expensive than living with a higher footprint. And points like insulating your house to high levels or deciding not to have a private car. So it's a way in which achieving a true one planet footprint is made much easier. And that in itself, to, to, for some households to be able to achieve that is an important achievement. Um, the travel impacts are fully accommodated within the management plan and the form of a, a travel plan has to be produced. Um, so 
there is strong encouragement to already to use uh, non-carbon, non-fossil fuel modes, so walking and cycling. Also, access to public transport for the, the selection of an OPD site is also important. So it's all accounted for within the OPD model. The important thing, though, is to realize also the role of the footprinting analysis. Foot, environmental footprinting is a personal consumption model of footprinting. So basically how it works is everything you spend, because it's spend-based, because that's something we can all get hold of, on various things throughout a year is, is totted up, and then it produces the footprint calculation with some adjustments for your ability to meet things like your need for food or energy from site, which isn't normally within the model and had to be specially prepared for the one used for OPD. So transport, as with other activities, um, is captured by the footprint as well, because I, you know, a criticism could be that, well, that's all very well. You say you're not going to drive very much and you're going to, you know, the, the point of an OPD is you can meet most of your everyday needs on site. So you shouldn't need to go to other places. You know, you, you have your, your work base there, you have your food base there, your home is there, your energy is there and so on. So the whole point is don't leave site, uh, particularly when you consider the three main contributions to footprint are domestic energy, private transport and food. Well, you can do all of those things on an OPD, feed yourself, have a high, uh, highly insulated home, and you shouldn't need to travel much. That's mainly how the footprint is reduced. But just that, so happened that um, someone was trying to cheat it, and they uh, drove a lot or flew a lot. You know, took a, took a few trips to New Zealand every year. Uh, it would be captured by the footprint, and the footprint would be blown because the footprint is an absolute requirement that you get down to 1.88 within five years. So it, it's in there as the answer. Um, and I guess the question is also uh, seeking a comparison with things in the more general experience of um, what the planning system is trying to do. OPD is just trying to do them in microcosm on one site. You know, switching from private and fossil fuel cars is also fundamentally important as this behavior change to hitting net zero. I'm on the, the Devon net zero task force. I'm the planner on that. Um, we're having a really thorny time at the moment discussing planning issues because the ask of the planning system is to do way more than it's done in the past so that we can get to net zero. Uh, and OPD is, is one example of uh, ways in which it can be achieved. And that's why uh, Dartmoor have got it in their local plan. They've, they've put it in there because they know it's not the answer for everyone, but it's useful to have some of it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, James. That's really useful. And um, we'll move on to the next question here. So our next question is directed at you, David. Um, can those born or living outside of Wales apply for One Planet Development? Um, yes. Okay. It's a short question, and many of them do, but it, 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 can, it has become a slightly controversial issue uh, from certain objectors to OPD in Wales that it's uh, a loophole for or it's, a, it's, a, it's an open door for people from outside of Wales to come and, and live in in Wales. Um, uh, this is an argument used by some who are, have, a, again, a political, ideological angle. Um, but there, because there's absolutely no reason why anybody can't apply under this policy, it's inclusive. Um, Welsh people, Welsh farmers, anybody can and do apply and do get planning permission to do this. Um, the, uh, of course, there, there are other restrictions on people coming to the UK uh, from outside the UK that apply to everybody as well. So provided all those are taken account of, then yes, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you, David. And um, we move on to the next question. Okay, this one's also directed at you first, David. So, when Planet Development Practice Guidance has obviously you know, been introduced by the Welsh Government, but it was suggested to you in our previous seminar that it isn't particularly well known. Um, we just sort of want to know your thoughts on this and sort of what could be done to increase awareness of this throughout Wales and obviously um, wider. Yeah, it would, it would be nice if, um, the Welsh Government did more to support, somewhat more to promote the policy uh, and at the moment they, they leave it up to local authorities to either promote or support or not the policy. 
Um, and to, you know, we're probably leading into the question about whether um, uh, well, what the barriers are to OPD. I mean, I wouldn't say at this point that a key barrier is lack of awareness, but because there is quite a lot of interest, however, it would be nice to get a lot more awareness. And I, I hope to produce some videos to promote it um, in the near future. Um, I, I do think that there are so many benefits, which James has pointed out some of them to the policy, um, not just the fact that it addresses the um, climate and ecological emergency has been one of the criteria is improving the biodiversity of the plot that you're responsible for. Uh, but because you're working within nature and you're living within nature, it has an enormous benefit on health, fitness, well-being, and so on and so forth. So the, the, there are these other reasons why people are interested in it and indeed why, why it should be promoted. Um, <coughs> I basically think that because it from the point of view of the Welsh Government, it is a relatively minor um, piece of planning legislation. They don't necessarily give it the, the attention that it deserves, especially at the moment when there are so many other competing factors. But we continue to promote it, we continue to push them. And because I see it, like James, as if you like the thin end of the wedge, uh, the other end of the wedge being complete, um, completely sustainable, uh, way of life for everybody, it's a pioneering system. And uh, previously to this, I worked at the Centre for Alternative Technology near McHuncliffe, which when it was founded in 1975, it itself was seen uh, as the province of a bunch of hippies and, and loonies and Bay Fringe, but within 30 years became extremely well known all over the world, and its experts were sought by the Welsh Government and beyond uh, to tell them how to live sustainably and uh, do things that would, would uh, reduce carbon pollution. Uh, it just takes a lot of time, but it also takes a lot of lobbying. Yeah, that's appreciated, David. Um, thank you for that. Um, so this one I'd like to sort of direct initially more at James. So, um, within our previous um, webinar, there were sort of arguments that a tax-driven approach could be where one planet development goes next. And I feel you sort of possibly touched on this slightly already, but do you think that this approach will be feasible and would it align with the fundamental requirements of one planet development? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... Pity I can't see everybody because I get you to wave like we do in Zoom calls. Has anybody seen the Regen Villages website um, initially produced by Effect, which is a Danish uh, architecture company and being promoted by a guy called James Ehrlich, who's, who's really interesting, nice man, uh, kind of software developer from uh, California. Um, it's a very high-tech approach. It's kind of vertical farming within greenhouses, all controlled by a, a kind of shared app resource. Um, very high-tech approach when, and could be seen as one way to skin one planet development. My concern with tech, though, is that partly it will, it's, it's trying to mask the fact that this is really not as directly principally at one planet development, that in order to achieve anything like the response we need to the ecological and climate emergencies, we need behavior change. In the work we're doing in Devon, we've established that about half of the carbon reductions you need to make, you can get through technological change and swapping energy sources. Um, the other half you need through behavior change. And putting it very simply, we need to live smaller, more localized lives where we get more of what we need from closer to hand and therefore reducing the resource burden within that. So, was technology obviously has a place in terms of addressing that. If technology is used to just try and perpetuate the existing patterns of life that we experience in Wales and the UK at the moment, then it, it will run out of steam at some point. And the notion of appropriate technology, I find, is a much more useful one. It's, it's being more used in the developing world, but appropriate technology in a nutshell is just enough technology to do the job and no more. So in terms of APD, we still need to go back to the fundamental principles of APD, which is getting down to a one planet, uh, a one planet footprint. And, and the main ways you do that are by living in highly insulated houses, 
trying to meet much more of your own food needs from locally and ideally your site and traveling less. And technology won't skin all of that for us. Um, I suspect we'll touch on more of this also when we talk about the relevance of APD to bigger site solutions. So um, I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'll start bleeding into other questions. No problem. Thank you, James. That's great. Okay. So um, this next one we would like to direct towards um, David. So there doesn't sort of appear to be any planning guidance in Wales relating to OPD on edge of settlements or within a town or a city. Um, could you sort of please confirm if there are plans to introduce a new set of compliance standards um, which will sort of enable edge of settlement town and or city one planet developments? Yes, can I just add something to the previous question, which is um, yeah, James, James used the word uh, appropriate technology. I would also add eco minimalism. So, eco minimalism is a word that means doing more with less. And um, it's a permaculture approach, if you like, but it's also approach that she, an approach that's used in architecture. Uh, if you um, look at passive house, for instance, that you can achieve passive house results with or without certain levels of of uh, technology and if you can do something without technology uh, uh, so much the better um, briefly uh, you what you're always looking for in permaculture is solutions that that um, solve multiple problems at the same time and, and that's another useful way of, of looking at this and it we have a, a tradition in the west particularly of using technology to solve what we perceive as, as one problem and it actually creates a whole load of other problems and so what we have to do is always look at the life cycle uh, impact of a particular uh, approach to, to solving a problem which include which would include both social and environmental uh, impacts as well as financial ones which we're just not used enough to doing but we need to learn to do uh, sorry, now to, to move on to your... Uh, yeah, that's, that's really useful, yeah. thanks, David. Um, uh, yes, to technical advice note six, which uh, refers to one planet development, acknowledges that it could happen within an existing settlement and on the edge of, an, of, a, of a settlement, as well as in the open countryside, but planning guidance was only ever issued for the open countryside. Um, so the principle is, is acknowledged uh, as potentially feasible but nothing has yet been forthcoming in order to test it so I'm quite interested in doing this to this extent we've done a feasibility study for a one planet neighborhood on edge of settlement um, it has a number of recommendations uh, one of which is uh, was to form a, a community land trust which we have done and we're looking for land again I, I, I collect examples from all over the world of similar kinds of approaches. There's nothing exactly the same, but um, similar things have been done, say, on, uh, in, on the edge of Sacramento with a project called Cannery. Um, there are various kind of bow group and type developments in Vienna uh, and in parts of Germany. Uh, there is something in Leicester, the Saffron Lane development, which is 60 uh, houses, 60 odd houses, in a passive house estate alongside uh, allotments um, <clears throat> but they uh, in, in each case they, they do struggle with with the planning system so how, how can the one planet development principles be adapted basically so that anybody could live the one planet life we know already that people in existing one planet developments have regular jobs uh, i know of one couple who have their two or three acres they, that they meet all the criteria. One of them works full time as a nurse. The other one is retired. So it's not it's not that difficult. Quite quite a few residents do have other jobs, you know, regular jobs as well as doing OPD. But it is hard work. It's not easy. So we want to make it easier. One of the potential trade offs there could therefore be for a community, uh, a neighbourhood on the edge of an existing settlement, is because the transport uh, element of the um, of the criteria is reduced because they're right near the town and because the residents would form some of the residents would form micro businesses supplying goods and services to the residents of the of the nearby town that has the effect of reducing the ecological footprint 
of the town as a whole because they're not buying those services from outside they're not buying their food so much from supermarkets and so on and so forth so in exchange for that reduction of the general local and environmental footprint the conditions for the residents should be made less onerous and one way to do this we suggest is that instead of the 65 percent of minimum needs having to be met by land-based businesses land-based activities this could be reduced to 30 percent so as i say we're looking for land we're talking to councils and, and we hope at some point to to bring this forward and, and test it within the planning system but it would be a great deal of help if the welsh government now in, in, instituted a review of this essentially 10 year old policy and this will be one of the things that they could look at as part of that process brilliant thanks david um, and yeah. do you have any thoughts I, on that yeah. yeah i'd like to jump in as well i mean basically because it's in planning policy wales and tan six there's no reason why a, a welsh local authority could not if it chose develop uh, a one planet policy for something larger than single plots or, or collections of single plots and for, as David's outlined, for uh, small towns, villages, uh, instead of an exception site, you could have a one planet site that addressed the affordable housing issues, but at the same time also addressed other issues, um, principally the two emergencies. And I'm also uh, have given some thought to what the kind of parameters for a larger OPD might be. And for me, we have these two really strong imperatives of sequestering carbon and trying to do nature recovery to, to, to recover biodiversity and biocapacity. And through the planning system, we could do that on the, with using OPD. If instead of some of the very intricate detail of OPD, we, we were able to say to a larger OPD that also included mass sequestration through reforestation principally and good forest management because let's remember that most of Wales' smaller woodlands are not well managed at all and also strong nature recovery that could be um, seen as part of the environmental balance in favour of OPD instead of some of the very detailed criteria that are household by household at the moment so it's an entirely adaptable policy similarly a developer could bring forward a site but the thing for uh, both to realize is you can't compete with open market housing here because of all these extras that you get and the extra land that you need to provide more localized support for lifestyle and livelihood. Uh, the, the land value created by APD is minimal compared to open market housing. So uh, essentially it needs to be regarded as an exception and where it's uh, allocated in local plans, it needs to be allocated separately from housing sites. Brilliant. Thanks, James. And I think this um, will link into um, our next question quite nicely. And um, so, during our sort of our previous um, One Planet webinar, um, there was a discussion of the remit of One Planet development be extended beyond single households and rural areas, such as the idea of gentle densification. Um, do you think this is possible? If so, sort of what steps do you think? Need to be taken to achieve this and um, also is it enough to focus the efforts of one plant development on a new development schemes or is there scope to work on reducing the footprint of the existing housing stock too um, so i know we've touched on some of these points already but if you just have sort of any thoughts james and issue and obviously david as well yeah i mean i would i would reflect again that really there's not a great deal of difference between one planet and net zero yeah. Whatever imperative you you have in your mind, and clearly we need to be using. Well, we need to try and achieve net zero or one planet everywhere, and that includes existing patterns of development, new patterns of development that we might create, and also thinking about how we manage the wider countryside. So um, there are many many steps, and I'll leave more of them to David because he's written the One Planet Cities book that you can you can take within urban areas to greatly help with decarbonisation and the capacity for rooftop solar, the uh, potential for reforesting urban areas stands nuts, but there's loads, you could, loads of places you could put trees that immediately help with cooling, with uh, air quality and also sequestration. So the one planet principles apply across the board. I, I, and it's just a question of, um, 
dealing with the area of existing development, the policy would definitely need adjusting, principally because you don't have the land to play with to uh, produce the land-based activity. Thanks, James. David? Yes, if, if you think about it, cities in themselves are like giant vacuum cleaners, hoovering up resources from all over the world. And then, uh, and those resources include water, they include energy, and they include nutrients in soil, which come to the, to the cities in the form of food and other products, and are then excreted by those cities and wasted. And that is true both for households and for industry, business, and, and every, every activity of a city. And if you add all of this up, you get the ecological footprint. So the challenge of reducing the footprint of cities is huge. And as James says, it, it will require renaturing, uh, or as Herbert Giraudet puts it, re regenerating cities by making them much more nature friendly, which is certainly very possible. And can it be done in a dense environment? Yes, Singapore is one of the most dense city, densely populated cities on the planet. It is also one of the greenest and has specific policies in place to encourage greenery to be put almost everywhere, both in green infrastructure and, and in um, little areas of greenery and, wood and, and so on and so forth. So this all has to be led by legislation particularly planning legislation. And um, it's, it's, it will be instructive for the RTPI and its members to look at examples of this kind of le legislation all around the world and the way in which it is mandated, implemented and supported. Um, it, the key selling point of o OPD is measurement and verification, which is similar to that used in energy management uh, energy systems with an ISO attached to it, 5001. <clears throat> and I, I basically took that approach uh, and, and expanded it to the whole idea of footprinting uh, in One Planet Cities, and which is packed with examples that I collect from all over the world in every area from industry, housing, neighborhood planning, um, and so on. And at the end, I have an extended case study on the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales. Um, and uh, then I, I summarise it in a kind of five or six step plan, which authorities could put in place, whether the government, national government level or local level. But it, it always begins with looking at the baseline. What are your impacts at the moment? Um, Calibrating where they come from and where, they, where everything goes to. So it's the metabolic flow through a given city or given area of land, whether it's country or not. And then you have to work out how to minimize the inputs and what to do with the outputs. So the end becomes circular. Uh, so you then set a target objective of say 30 years. So we've got to get to 2050, uh, for example. And uh, in the same way that the Climate Change Act does in the UK, You've got a series of budgets along the way, maybe every five years, and a set of markers so you can measure your progress along that. You break it down into sectors of industry, housing, food, energy, and so on. Each sector is then monitored, has its own targets within that. And you're trying to achieve the quick wins and then the harder wins take time. Uh, and, and you have to get everybody on board as well with a massive publicity, uh, marketing uh, event that's ongoing to get ideas from people as well because once they see government doing it and the support coming from government there's a groundswell of opinion on, on at the grassroots level people want to do this they want to lead a much more sustainable life but they don't know how to so if they get the support from government to do this then it's much more likely to happen Brilliant, thanks, David. That's um, that's really useful. That's um, the end of, we, of the questions we sort of had from the previous seminar. But I know we've had a lot going on in our chat box while we've all been chatting here. Um, I just hope I know James, you've responded already to some. Um, I'm just wondering. Yeah. 
Shall I, shall I take Sally's question on protected landscapes? Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thanks, James. Yeah, if you start with that. Um, yeah, so um, the OPD policy applies across the board in Wales. There is no exclusion from protected landscapes. Um, and there's a very sort of fundamental reason for that, which is OPD, as David began to explain, is, is the process involves initially establishing a baseline, which is essentially uh, borrowed from permaculture design. You say, well, where do I start from? Um, what is my context? What can I achieve from this site? And the guidance does include uh, a warning that not all sites will be possible to do APD on. And there are probably two reasons for that. The first is that some it will just be too hard. If you want to uh, try an APD halfway up a mountain, you're not going to be able to meet your needs from that site. So some sites are just too difficult and rightly won't offer that support to live on them. The second is probably a landscape point that there will be some sites where the landscape impact of uh, new buildings principally will be uh, unacceptable. Uh, not often, but that's certainly the case. So we have OPDs that have been permitted in, from my memory, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park and also the Brecon. Um, but I don't have an extensive memory on that. Uh, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park has specific guidance that is a companion to the OPD national guidance and really just does a little bit of extra interpreting in terms of the national park purposes, but it's essentially uh, reinforcing the guidance. Your context though in a national park is a different starting point. You have a higher level of landscape protection. And you also have the statutory basis of the, of the purposes and the duty. So. I don't, it's in no way is OPD uh, impossible within a protected landscape. There are probably fewer opportunities just because of the nature of most protected landscape are upland and therefore more sites are more exposed. Um, but other than that, um, OPD is perfectly possible because we need to remember in national parks that the social, uh, the social and economic reproduction of the landscape is a fundamental part of what a national park's about. I, by the way, led the review of the Welsh National Parks in 2004 for the Welsh Government. Um, these aren't natural landscapes, they're man-made landscapes and their uh, conservation and enhancement requires social, socio-economic activity. OPD is a particularly benign example of that sort of activity. So in terms of the, on, the, the ongoing story of a national park, that OPD begins to then fill spaces in the national park and enhance and conserve its landscape and its historic importance and the other special qualities is, is perfectly possible and was thoroughly understood when the guidance was being written and the national policy is being written. Otherwise, there would be a prohibition of OPD within the protected landscapes, which make up a third of the area of Wales, and there isn't. Brilliant. Thanks, James. David, do you have anything to build on that? Yeah, so some uh, national parks, uh, as Snowdonia, I've heard, uh, uh, would actually like to have uh, applications for one private developments. I don't think there have been any so far. Uh, the one in, uh, I know Birkin Beacons National Park because it's just over here. Um, some of my friends have, have, have uh, got their first OPD accepted by the park authority, and it certainly fulfills all the criteria in their sustainability strategy. I would like to say one other thing which hasn't been mentioned yet, and that is because uh, these sites are monitored or, or monitor themselves and report, uh, we know how product, our land productivity changes when it's converted from, say, sheep farm to uh, as, well, essentially small holdings. Then um, we know that for uh, lamb for instance, after five or six years, productivity went up by 32 times. In other words, it, it was also supporting nine families, whereas previously it supported one sheep farming family with subsidies. There are no subsidies, of course, for OPD. Uh, and this, this fact alone shows how changing land management practice to much more sustainable land management by feeding the soil and looking after biodiversity reaps rewards for the humans who live on that land as well. This is another great selling point for OPD approach. Brilliant. Um, thanks, David. There's also, um, I can see another question from Sally here, and um, it's also directed at Neil, who's um, um, providing comments, who was part of our previous webinar. And um, the question is, do you feel that LPAs 
have been too obstructive to date in permitting when planet developments? Yeah, can I just... Yes, sorry. Um, sorry, James, you can, I'm sure you have something to add, but, but because we recently did a survey on this, um, uh, um, because we heard from um, a member, an official within the Welsh Government that they were surprised that there hadn't been more planning applications and, uh, and, and more passes actually, more people doing it um, within the 10 years the policy has been in place uh, and they want to know why. So we asked uh, for feedback and I've got the document here which has gone back to these guys, we're waiting to hear back more from their um, of the evaluation of it, but uh, the particular issues were conflict with, with local plans, uh, it was found. The process seems overly bureaucratic. Uh, many planning authorities are not uh, equipped properly to, to, act, to, to evaluate uh, the planning applications. Many applicants are not equipped to produce what is essentially an extremely complicated document, which can be 80 pages plus a whole load of appendices. It takes an inordinate length of time um, and there is prejudice and misinformation still about the type of people who are applicants which is not held by the fact that on the front cover of the planning guidance there exists a picture of a hobby house which should really be changed because as James has said it's all about performance it's not about what the house looks like so there's a great deal of variation between how different LPAs handle handle the applications and these are things, and we come up with a num number of suggestions, like I say, a policy review, support for a body uh, that does accreditation for training, um, that work government could provide special planning guidance to LPAs to adopt uh, a, a local plan that recognises the contributions that LPD makes to the climate and the ecological emergencies, and it could coordinate the retrieval and constructive use of the monitoring data that I've referred to, uh, which is extremely powerful data providing feedback on how effective OPD is at tackling these emergencies. Okay. Um, I think before you answer James, Neil's made quite an interesting point that, um, thanks for that David as well, that um, as knowledge and understanding increases and that as applicants become better to, to meet the requirements of the process, then um, increasingly planning applications are being approved by RPAs rather than going to appeal. Um, so yeah. Um, just your thoughts on that really in response James yeah I think that's pretty fair in the early days of the policy coming in I think most local authorities and particularly councillors just wanted what on earth it was and were quite resistant to it because it feels like it goes against the grain of, of received planning wisdom and that we restrict development in the open countryside um, and there were definitely um, some cases refused that shouldn't have been and were therefore subsequently allowed to appeal. I think the whole, on both sides, the local authorities and the applicants have got much more knowledge and understanding now and the quality of applications has generally got better and their determination has got more thorough. So, I mean, to give you an example, two or three years ago I was at Lammas Eco Village when an application on the site next door was approved at committee the night before and the councillor came rushing up to the, the couple who'd got the consent to shake their hands the next day. So there's definitely been a, a change in how these things are understood and uh, how it goes now. Um, not to say there aren't some bad applications that deserve to be refused and I put in the chat box that you know, quite often the ones that are refused are the retrospective ones. Um, where there's a, a you know a lot less thorough applications been made, so I, I think we've learnt in the last ten years a lot more about what APD is and, and learnt to trust it, uh, particularly from the local authority side. Brilliant. Um, thank you both. Um, I believe Neil's made another point, but I think you've already responded in the chat box, James. I think it was a reference to um, what difference, if any, do you feel it makes to have. OPT or OP style policy established nationally rather than locally. Um. Yeah, I think I think it's. I'd like to use that as a to make a series of wider points. I mean, clearly having national policy in Wales is is radical and has made a significant difference. And, and the Welsh government deserves to be fully commended for bringing this policy in and standing by it. You know, it's it's a pioneering policy. Is essentially it's experimentation. And, and we need these experiments in the context of, of ecological and climate breakdown. Um, 
it would be possible for English authorities to introduce uh, such a policy. If I just real read you a section from the English National Planning Policy, um, which kind of sets the context for this, it, the planning system should support the transition to a low carbon future and a changing climate, taking full account of flood risk and coastal change. It should help to colon, shape places in ways that contribute to radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, just as, as planners think about the last planning application you saw approved that would produce radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, we, we just don't do that stuff. And yet it's in the national policy in England, albeit sitting amongst all sorts of other things, because we absolutely need to do that. Um, and OPD is a way in which we can do that. So the climate and ecological emergencies are critical context here that didn't exist in, in 2012. Well, they did obviously but they weren't as high profile and and i want to also just talk briefly about the notion of regenerative approach versus sustainable development we use sustainable development as a catch-all phrase for all sorts of things but it's really important to understand where it came from you know the 70s and the 80s and the 90s with the imperative of trying to keep enough of the environment and global resources so that we wouldn't run out of them and hit trouble we've blown that We've utterly blown that and we're in a regenerative paradigm now where we need to rebuild as quickly as possible and we need to uh, repair climate repair as quickly as possible to av avoid collapse and therefore sustainable isn't enough and as planners looking for ways in which our work can act actively rebuild natural systems is deeply important though the shrinking and the and the deprioritization of the planning system we've all experienced over the last 30 years is very difficult but no one else in the local government or the national government frame takes a takes the current situation imagines it 20 years forward and then tries to get there and that's what planners do it's an exciting time for us but the challenge is phenomenal and OPD provides a little glimpse of what we can do if we get a bit more detailed and a bit more purposeful Brilliant. That's um, that's great, James. I'm just wondering if you want any final thoughts, David, before we close today's uh, yeah, webinar. Well, I see absolutely no reason in principle why all planning applications shouldn't be evaluated on, on a similar basis to OPD. Uh, this idea that there uh, has to be a management plan, that there has to be monitoring, and there has to be reporting on that monitoring to ensure, uh, firstly, that we reach uh, one planet, and secondly, that uh, developers, uh, the end result of a development is something which is actually was intended in the first place. So this is all about post occupancy evaluation, which is beginning to be done with housing, but needs to be done with with development in general. And the second point I'd like to add is that any councils should be able to make land available for asset transfer, asset transfer to bodies like community land trusts, housing co-ops, or any kind of form of, of new kind of development that can deliver one planet development to one sort or another at scale within their domain. Brilliant. Well, um, that's well. Thank you both very much, and um, for attending here today. I'll see James Shorten, one of the authors of. The guidance and David Thorpe, co founder of the One Planet Council. And thank you for taking the time to be here. And also, thank you to Roisin from the RTPI. And um, wow. also, thank you to all of the attendees today. Um, and also, we will circulate wow. the recording of this afterwards. And I know we've had some comments of um, the previous webinar, which we can also send out to attendees. Um, but thank you all for attending and appreciate the time that you've taken. And um, we have yeah, future uh, um, webinars coming up, so we'll keep you posted on our social media sites. But um, thank you both to David and James today for your thoughts and your time. It's really appreciated. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Stay safe, stay well. See you all. Bye. Bye.